Massive demonstrations in Israel have forced the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to pause the controversial judicial reform bill. But he declares that he will still push ahead with the judicial overhaul. But what does this mean for Netanyahu's coalition and for Israel? I'm Raisha Segal, and in this episode of Beyond Conversation, we will decode if Netanyahu will be able to press ahead with the judicial overall bill. To answer all this and a lot more, we're now being joined by Alan Bernstein from California. He's a visiting assistant professor at Israel Institute, fellow Department of Political Science. Thank you so much for joining us in Beyond, Professor. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Right. Now, we at Beyond have, of course, been tracking the story very closely. And there were times on Monday, in fact, even you joined us on Monday, when uh, the demonstrations and protests broke out in Israel, where it really felt that due to the chaos and demonstrations in Israel, Netanyahu's political future could be hanging in the balance. But now, he has managed to halt the reform bill and also the demonstrations. And in fact, even his coalition is intact at the moment. My question to you is that, how did Netanyahu manage to do all of this? So I would argue that Netanyahu was trying already for several weeks to find a way to come to some sort of compromise within his coalition and halt the legislation. He sensed that he could not go forth with the legislation as it was originally proposed and keep his coalition intact. The problem is that other members of the coalition, specifically the hawkish right-wing parties and the old Orthodox parties, threatened that if he withhold the legislation, they will tear apart the coalition. What happened on Monday is that all parties realized that the, the situation cannot continue. The mass demonstrations that broke out also shut down the country physically in terms of blocking almost all the highways. And also in response to his attempt to fire Minister of Defense Gallant, the General Federation of Workers, which is Israel's sort of all-encompassing labor union, declared a general strike. This includes shutting down the hospitals. This includes shutting down the airport. And even within his coalition, there was recognition we have to find some way to come to a halt. So he spent the day, and we spoke, I think, about this several times throughout the day, he spent the day right. trying to go to each one of his parties and figure out, okay, what can I give you so we can all agree that we need to climb down and halt the legislation right now? And they all agreed, but they all really had no choice. If the situation continued as it was on Monday, the country had ceased to function in all intents and purposes. Absolutely, Professor. Now, the judicial overall bill has been uh, paused for now, not scrapped. I want to ask you that, will this actually convince Israelis and the demonstrators from not coming out on the streets and protesting? Because uh, we heard that on Tuesday and on Monday, a, a lot of Israelis said that uh, this is no victory at all and maybe Netanyahu could come back more stronger. So, most people in Israel, I would argue, at least certainly the protesters, do have no faith that Netanyahu is actually halting the negotiations in order to come with, in good faith, to come up with some sort of compromise. A lot of people who are protesting were part of major protests that happened against him already three years ago when he signed a deal with then, who was the alternative prime minister, Benny Gantz, and he ended up betraying him in that deal. So it is true that a lot of people on the protesters' side, at least, feel there is absolutely no good faith here and this is just a trick in order to come back stronger. The different uh, protesting groups are actually right now very conflicted about what to do. A strong element within them are saying we must continue to come out every week. We have a gun to our head in the sense that the legislation could be put back any day. We have to also maintain the pressure from our side to remind the government and the opposition we can still shut down the country every day. In right. turn, other, other members, other groups within sort of the protest movement are saying, no, we need to give the, the negotiations a chance. We need to show that we're not the ones who, who sort of torpedo the negotiations by still coming out to protest all the time. So they're really having an argument about what's going to happen this weekend already. Should they go out? Should they not go out? I believe what we will see is still thousands of people going out, but far less. We're not going to see the same 600, 700,000 that we saw last weekend. Absolutely. Let's also just talk about what happened uh, yesterday. Netanyahu has clearly said that the decision to halt the judicial overhaul bill was done in a bid to not divide the nation. He says that the decision wasn't taken due to pressures from abroad. How much sway does uh, Washington have on Netanyahu's decision at the moment? I would argue that Washington has monumental strength in influencing Netanyahu and his government. Since the government was sworn in, which is all three months ago, almost to the day, um, Netanyahu has given four to five different press interviews. None of them were to the Israeli press. 
Four of them were to the North American press. One of them was to the press in the United Kingdom. Netanyahu cares very, very much what they think about him in North America. We saw this also with his Minister of Finance, Vitaly Smotrich, who came to the United States and was trying very hard to meet with government officials, to meet with finance ministries, to meet with heads even of the Jewish community. And he was shunned by all of them. It was sort of unprecedented that even the heads of the Jewish community in the United States, which usually welcome all Israeli delegates with open arms, said, we are not talking to members of this government. That really bothers the Israeli administration. Israel is dependent on the United States also in economic support, but primarily in diplomatic support. And Netanyahu politically has always been the source of strength. It has always been that he's a big player in the international arena. And I think what the president of the United States, Biden, said just yesterday when he explicitly said not only is he very worried about what's happening in Israel, but specifically he will not be inviting Netanyahu anytime soon, I think is a major blow to Netanyahu, both his personal image and his political image in Israel that he's trying to cultivate. But absolutely, Professor, just to add to what you said, that um, after that, Netanyahu said that uh, the relations between U.S. and Israel are unbreakable, and even though they may have disagreements on certain occasions. But um, I also want to seek your perspective on how people have been demonstrating for months in Israel now. But was it the defense minister's dismissal that acted as the last nail in the coffin? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the protests that happened throughout the last three months have been by people who either were seeing themselves out to defend democracy or just saw the very, very hawkish right-wing government as a threat to Israel's democratic values. But what broke the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, is the dismissal of the defense minister Gallant. And the reason is the defense minister came to Netanyahu several days before and warned him that the judicial reform is starting to influence the Israeli defense force, the military. There's right. starting to be divisions within the military. The military units are starting to have a lot less volunteers, and that this is really weakening the army. The army in Israel is seen as a holy grail. It's seen as something sanctified. It's something right. that's above politics. The army is the only reason that the Jewish people can live in peace. And the fact that as punishment for trying to protect the army, Gallant was fired, was really something that in Israeli culture you can't contain. Most For most people, this was a betrayal of the very ethos of Israel, the okay. idea that there will be a Jewish army protecting the Jewish people, but then Netanyahu was willing to fire the minister just for trying to protect the army was really seen as a betrayal of a lot of things that people would perceive Israel should stand for. Right, Professor. Also, like, uh, Netanyahu has been persistent regarding this bill. And now he's, uh, he's paused it, not scrapped it, like what we discussed just a short while ago. But I want to see your perspective on how, what impact will the, uh, the this, this overall bill have on Netanyahu's uh, political future? So, right now, the recent polls have come out, even though the government has only existed for three months, that show that Netanyahu's party, the Likud, is absolutely in a free fall if elections happen today from having some polls, they now have 32 seats, but which show them previously having 34, now showing them having between 24 and 25. That is a major decline. Right now, the way the government has handled itself in the last three months has been very detrimental for the Likud, which is, I think, the reason that Netanyahu was so scared that his government might fall apart as a result of what happened on Monday. What this will hold for the future, it's very hard to say because it very much depends on what happens in, in the next couple of months. People, different party leaders within Netanyahu's coalition are very hawkish. They are really standing fast that the judicial reform must pass in its initial form. And even if there's a small compromises, it shouldn't matter. Whereas in turn, there are other elements within his government, Netanyahu included, who are willing to recognize we can't do that and also not look terrible to the people. We need to find some compromise. It's a, it's, the question is, who will he manage to convince? Will he manage to convince the more hawkish elements within his government to dial down the reform? And then he might be able to pass something that he'll be able to sell as, look, we created a compromise for the good of the people, we've unified everyone, and here's a good reform. Or will he not be able to pacify them? And then in a few months, we will probably see a repeat of this again, him trying to push the same thing forth again. And then the people will likely take to the streets again, and right. then who knows what will be the next case.
Absolutely. My last question to you before I let you go, Professor. Do you think that the coalition will be able to hold up over the Passover? There's a couple of things that are coming together. There's Passover next week. It's also Ramadan, which is a holiday holy to the Muslims, and that often creates a lot of tension within the West Bank between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, and specifically around Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa. Um, I think the coalition will likely be able to hold together, but I do think that we're going to see a lot of tensions. I don't think that we're going to, in the next two weeks, there is likely going to be spontaneous eruptions of violence in East Jerusalem between Israeli police and Muslim worshippers coming to Al-Aqsa Mosque for Ramadan. We will also see sort of hawkish, uh, extreme Jewish activists trying to do all kinds of things on Temple Mount or Haram al-Sharif, which is right near the Al-Aqsa Mosque, in order to show that this is their place to pray in Passover. We will likely see a lot of collisions that will cause a lot of tensions in the coalition. I do think the coalition will likely survive, but it's going to be very fraught with tensions in the next couple of weeks. Right, Professor. We will, of course, have to wait and watch and see what happens next in Israel and the political future of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Thank you so much for joining us in Vion and sharing your insights on this. Thanks very much. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.